I am always uh, delighted to talk about account management. Um, and I get very frustrated by charts like this. So my first chart is specifically designed to annoy myself. Um, what is the point of account management? I think there's moments in time uh, where this subject dies down and then, subject, then suddenly it becomes the subject du jour again. I think there was, um, there was a fabulous article in Ad Age, I think a couple of weeks ago, and it's worth you just trawling through it and having a look at it. It seems to be one of those questions that is again uh, the topic of the day. And <coughs> I get frustrated because I have such, um, and I have to admit this prejudice before I actually get into charts and all sorts and advice, um, I have a prejudice in that obviously account management is one of the most powerful uh, uh, functions within agencies. I'm absolutely 100% clear on it. I'm very grateful to my career in account management. I still consider myself an account woman. Uh, a suit, if you wish, although I've never worn a suit. Um, and I'm very grateful to it for many, in many senses. It's taught me a lot. Um, it's kind of the MBA of, of learning programs, I think, if you're interested in business. And in terms of my own personal progression in our industry, there's a reason I'm CEO of DARE, and that's because I'm an account woman. Um, in fact, um, I remember going through some interview process and uh, meeting the fabulous Mark Collier and Paul Hammersley and John Bartle. <coughs> And at the time, I was very honest with them. I was like, why on earth would you hire me from what is supposedly quite a traditional uh, agency background, be it Saatchi's, Abbott Mead, what, what not, to come and run this agency, which is Digital Agency of the Decade, only a few years ago. I think we're allowed to claim that title for at least another seven years, so we're going to keep doing that. Um, why would you want someone like me running a digital agency? And, and the answer was because, well, you know how to look after the clients. You know how to get top table. You know how to get engagement with clients and the right conversations. So I'm very grateful for being an account person in a suit. It's led me on a fantastic career trajectory. Um, but I think in the interests of this conversation, and hopefully um, it will be useful to you, because I think knowledge is only the basis of a little bit of facts, um, a little bit of experience, and quite a lot of opinion. <laughs> um, and that's all this is today, is a lot of my opinion. Um, I think what I'm hoping to do is just give you a sense and strip it right back. The world has changed. The world has moved on. What is our role in that world? Is anyone here, just a show of hands, because I'm not going to do this all on my own, you're going to participate. <laughs> um, does anyone feel that there is a little bit of a crisis of confidence or that your agencies don't necessarily recognize account management? Show of hands, does anyone feel that might be the case? Glad to hear there's just a few. <laughs> Glad to hear that. And hopefully by the end of this, we'll give you some tools and some thoughts uh, that might stimulate a, a further debate. I think um, in the setup, <coughs> which uh, I wrote rather late at night. Um, it was a bit of a rant, and actually I didn't necessarily have the answer. I sort of used Mad Men as a, as a point of inflection from a presentation point of view. I don't literally mean back to the, was it the 60s or the 50s, Mad Men? Yeah. I don't mean going back that far. I think even going back five, ten years, the role of an account man was much simpler. Basically, you just had to pitch up, make sure that you knew a bit about your client's business, which is quite straightforward. Uh, you delivered the website or you delivered the TV ad and it was all pretty simple. And actually, I think digital agencies had it somewhat simpler because clients didn't understand digital at that point in time. So whatever you said was the truth, wasn't it? <laughs> so um, I think the world has definitely changed and it's become much more challenging. I mean, I, I've um, encountered lots of problems along the way, but in the last three, four years, the role has become even more intense. I think uh, media used to be something that, I mean, I grew up in Africa and... and we used to do everything. I had my media partner sitting right next to me when I started off, and it was fabulous because media and creative was the same thing, and I still think that is ultimately the way it should be working. It became separate. Now it's coming back into the conversation because you can't actually develop a piece of content without thinking about distribution and getting the right partner in your media agency or actually having that in-house. So what's that mean for the role of the account man? Do you know enough about media? How do you get to know enough about media? It's a big question for us. Project management, production. Where does their job start and where does mine start? And where, does, where do the two intersect? And that partnership, how does that work, is a very key issue. And what's the point of account management if someone else is delivering the stuff? You know, really? Frankly, I remember for years being told, your job is to make sure things happen. So I was like, Oof, that's the end of account management then. Clearly not. Uh, and, um, and I think there are some other issues like planning. I always remember, um, I think some of the old boys tell stories of how suits were MBAs, you know, if you, if you talk about Madison Avenue a few years ago, back in the Mad Men era, the suits were business people and they understood their clients' business and they knew how to get to the communication solution. 
I, I don't see many MBAs in account management at the moment. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And frankly, what do planners do? What is your relationship with planning? Whether that's UX, experience planning, or whether that's brand planning or social planning, what is your relationship with planning? If they're doing all the clever stuff, I hate those meetings where you walk in and go, here's the planner, they're the clever ones, I'm the suit. Never do that, okay? Just as a rule, never do that. So I think there is growing complexity as agencies get more sophisticated, as clients get dem more demanding, what is the role for account management? And it is good to reflect on it, I think. Um, this thing about media, I just love it. Does anyone here remember seeing uh, media schedules like that? You might actually still be seeing them. I have seen one or two. These still exist, slightly alarmingly. <laughs> this linear world of the campaign, and I think um, if you're in an agency that's still only accepting that kind of media plan, put your foot down, ask for more, go spend some time. Spend some time with people like John Wilkins and the boys. You'll, you'll, you'll hear exactly what people think about. Those days are over, and in fact, media planning is so complex now, you very rarely see charts that make any sense at all, frankly. They're all very intersected and ecosystem-like. Um, that is a, this is, this is sort of the perfect representation of how the world has changed. This is just a little snapshot into a bit of experience planning, which obviously Chatham House rules. I don't want people particularly dwelling on the details of this. But actually, if, you, if you're in um, the world of consumers and you put yourselves in the land of behavior and consumer behavior, the kind of planning we do these days is much more shaped like this, and it's much more detailed. It's much more based on behavior. It's much more data. It's much more data driven. So underneath understanding of consumers, there is this data thing. So I guess it's changed, and it's complex, and it's fast moving, and it doesn't. It's not static, and it's long term. You know, I think. It, in the old days, there used to be lots of talk about long-term planning for the brand, but in reality, it was campaigns. There was a campaign burst, peace and quiet, lots of sales as a result, and then move on. The way consumers interact with brands and businesses these days, we don't have that time. We, do, we have 24-7 as a result. Um, I want to show a piece of work that sort of sums up the change in the landscape, and it's a piece of work I've, I'm quite in awe of. It's a piece of work we've just done at Dare. And the reason I'm going to show it is not to market dare, but I think just to, to exemplify the way we have to solve problems these days. And I think this is a good example. Um, we are very involved with Barclays as a client. And this work is out there, so there's nothing um, discreet about this. And they have the sponsorship of the Premier League football. And for years, they've been trying to make something of this sponsorship. Lots of spend on signage, lots of spend on advertising. Um, but Ashok, the CEO, was like, well, how do I make this sponsorship meaningful? And I think different agencies would respond in different ways to that. What I liked about the way it, this agency, Dare, solved it in this particular instance was we said, well, how do, where, where is it that we're going to really intersect with this audience? What is the behavior that's going to make most sense to them? So we developed an idea which is data-oriented, that uses technology, that uses storytelling to solve the problem. And I think it's a great example, I think, of the changing kind of narrative and creativity as well. We want you to have your say, you are football.
Arctic's UR football campaign is a great idea. And I think that fans, for example, deserves a lot of credit. And I think that through this campaign, they're going to get something. So I've um, dwelt a little bit about how the world feels for us in our agencies, but I think it's also worth reflecting a little bit about the world of marketeers. And um, there's lots of data about um, how clients are feeling at the moment, and they're quite vociferous if you go and support any of the conferences, but they are clearly under pressure as well. So if we think the role of account management and the role of an agency is changing, actually clients are really struggling. I mean, some of these questions here about um, the pace of change in technology and marketing will continue to accelerate, 98% agree. You know, 89% of clients feel like they don't have the capacity to deal with that. Um, and marketing does things today no one thought would be res their responsibility three to four years ago, 85%. So, so I think there's an in interesting reflection there that this is not just um, relevant to us, this conversation. It's actually how most of your clients are feeling. Uh, this is Forrester. It's a fantastic article. Do, do take the time to go and read it up. And I, I, I sort of try to look at a, a more factual basis, look at the FTSE 100, just to establish how is business operating right now. And the rate of change is absolutely incredible. And I think whereas previously, five to ten years ago, there were the FTSE 100, and they were pretty stable. You knew who they would be predominant, dominated by telecoms, probably manufacturing, a little bit of pharma, and, and banking. And I think what's changed now is that there are fewer of those big block businesses supporting the FTSE. It's less stable. You don't know who to invest in, really, um, even the smart guys. There's a lot of small, higher risk companies coming and going. Um, and it's a much more volatile market. So, so I think we can't just uh, sort of separate out the fact that your role probably feels quite tough and interesting and changing at the moment, but so is business. This is not unique to us. And obviously, then, our, our role is under pressure. Uh, this was a, you know, you often have these kind of conversations with clients these days. I want direct access to UX. I want direct access to the designer. Um, and uh, I don't really need some middleman getting in the way and telling me how things should be and maybe not having all the answers. Have you, who's had a conversation like that? Anyone? Yeah. I don't let them do that about me. So I'm like, no, you need to speak to me. <laughs> Put your foot down. Um, so I think it is the reality of our industry. And, I, and as, a, as a moment of reflection on this, I, I think um, you can either take that as a negative or you go, actually, all this change, all this dynamic volatility is the most interesting time to be in our business. And um, if you think it's going to be easy, I, I would argue you're probably in the wrong business right now. It's not easy. It's tough. And you have to be have huge amount of, of a, an incredible work ethic to get through all that stuff and to be ahead of the game. But on the other hand, how fantastic. I personally don't want to go back to the Mad Men era. Number one, I wouldn't have got a job because <laughs> of my sex. Um, but number two, well, I'd maybe been a PA if I was very lucky, office manager. Um, uh, but, I, but I also think, and probably had to start smoking, actually. I'm not keen to go back to all that. And, and um, there's some fabulous stories from just 10 years ago about those great sort of giants of our industry brilliant. But actually, I think our industry now is in a very sort of interesting inflection point, And I couldn't be happier working as an account man, whatever my title might be. Um, so trying to be neat and tidy, I sort of think, what, is, what would my advice be if, if you want to try and um, be this consummate modern account man or woman? And um, I've got a few points. I don't, I'm sure I haven't covered all of the the, the um, advice I've learned along the way. Some of it's so um, uh, instinctive now, I'm not sure I, I can articulate it. I'm just so used to being the person who goes and takes on the big hairy client problems and does what needs to be done. I'm not sure I know quite how I do it anymore. <laughs> it gets a point of middle age where you just sort of get, forget what you've learned. Um, but I've tried to pull out the things that make most sense to me as we face into this new world and as we face into this volatility and, and exciting environment. Um, the first point I'd say is be strategic. Um, I, I think it's very, very easy to let other people put yourself, plan as a strategic, or UX is strategic, or my creative strategic. Actually, the most fundamentally important part of your role now is to be strategic. 
And um, I, I, do, I show this little exercise. My fontage has gone at the end. I apologise. Not a very good account man style. Uh, and this I, I nicked actually from Paul Hammersley. I love it. Um, it but it, it's the fish development story. So if you think about inputs, activities, output, outcome, and impact, this is a story about making fish soup, really. So the inputs are parents get together and you put together the nice, healthy ingredients. The activity is the mum and dad carefully prepare and cook all the, the ingredients. The output is that children taste the most nourishing fish soup in the world. The outcome is children consider the soup delicious and ask for soup, fish soup once a week. And the impact is children grow up healthy. So which is the most important of those strategic divisions in your head, if I were to put that to the floor? Which is the most important part of that process of making fish soup? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the reality as well as how you eventually get them to grow up healthy. And that's exactly the, rea the right um, response. And I think uh, this is a sort of an oversimplification, but of the problems you're facing day to day, make sure you understand what the outcome, the desired outcome is, before you even get into the mechanics of what you're trying to do. Because if you've got that macro perspective, whether you're building a website, doing an app, doing a two-year-long social media campaign for your football, or, or, or developing a TV ad, you know what the outcome is. And actually, every conversation then you're having with a client or internally, you just have a framework for thinking. Doesn't mean you don't worry about the activities and the inputs and the, the outputs. It just means make sure that you understand the impact of what you're doing. And I think that strategic thinking is not necessarily sitting and writing a brief, although I think it's very good for suits to write briefs, by the way. Um, but I think it is about making sure, even if it's one small execution you're focusing on, that you've thought through every single strategic challenge. And I know day to day it's really hard to put aside time to think. That's just the reality of business right now. So find the time to think things through. And if you're not sure how to do it, find yourself a buddy. One of the earliest pieces of advice I, um, I had um, um, going into the industry was find yourself a buddy who is very strategic. That doesn't mean a planner, by the way. It does mean someone who's very strategic. So great suits are strategic. Clients love that. They lap it up. I promise you, if you understand business, if you understand context, if you understand impact of what you're doing, clients take you seriously, and frankly, so do people internally in agencies. So um, have a think about, are you strategic? And if you're not, trust me, you can become strategic. It's not something that's born. You're not born strategic. <laughs> it is um, something that you do and learn with experience, but it's also reading. You know, If you haven't read a new book a week, or at least an interesting article on Twitter, you know, hold yourself up to that and go, you know what, on Sunday night, instead of watching whatever trash is on TV, Britain's Got Talent or whatever, just read something that's interesting and opens your mind up a little bit, which may or may not be relevant to your immediate day-to-day. -day. Um, I love this word partner. Um, I, I, I've got this slight tick in that I love looking up the origination of words, and partner is actually, in essence, having equity, shared equity in business, usually. Um, but I think it is also having shared equity in outcomes and the impact of what you do. Um, if you think about yourself as client services with your client and you find yourself just doing what you're told to do, I promise you that client over time will get, we're, quite quickly, will get wary of you. If you find yourself being sycophantic or pandering to creatives or designers or planners, you will quite soon find yourself redundant because no one wants someone just to do what they're told. No one wants that. That ain't a good job and it's not a very satisfying job. Make sure you're a partner, make sure you have shares, make sure you have a point of view. In, in what's going on the table. And I'm um, very strong-minded about that. As soon as people say to me, client services, I get a slight itch. <laughs> I know, I, I don't go and service and, and serve my clients. I'm not some waitress in a wet restaurant. I'm someone who's here to add value to the conversation, to challenge you, and to bring some new and fresh thinking or creativity to the table. So, so think very carefully about whether you're a partner. And I don't care how junior you are. You know, you're, actually, the more junior you are, oh, that's me moving around too much. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> um, you know, make sure um, that you're thinking about that. In fact, the opinions I often hear and are most interested in is people who are sort of slightly untainted from experience. The more ex experienced people in the business, will, oh, you've heard it before, you know how to solve problems, and you just kind of default to the finding the same solutions as you've done previously, what's the benefit of you guys? 
99% of you, as far well as I can tell, as you're all about 12, um, <laughs> is that you, you bring freshness. You haven't solved problems in the same way before, and that is your strength. So have, have some real confidence in being a partner and offering forth your point of view. No one will dismiss a point of view. They'll listen. It may not be the right point of view, but have the courage to put that forth. Um, there's a sort of a watch out around partnership, though. Um, and, and this one is from Maslow, as you always do. Chuck a Maslow quote into a presentation. Um, make sure you don't um, become the client. Make sure you don't become so client-oriented that you lose your objectivity. Because again, I've seen big businesses being fired from agencies for exactly that reason, where you almost become conditioned by the client and their behaviors and their structures and their processes to becoming exactly like them. There's this thing about dispassionate objectivity is itself a passion for the real and for the truth. So when a client comes to you and says, I want to launch a beer for women in this market, have a think about it. You know, just, is that really the smartest thing to do? You might not want to blurt it out in the first meeting, but you want to maybe go in and think about it and go, how am I going to, how am I going to think, how am I going to solve this problem in a way that's genuinely helpful to the consumer? So have some dispassion. Make sure you've got a little bit of distance. Don't become the client. Um, I've got it. <laughs> I'm slightly naughty. If a client is very formal, I often dress, and I, I, I can sort of get away with it, so make, be careful about how you use this advice. I often dress and act in a way that's slightly rebellious against that particular culture. Um, it's interesting because you walk in into a banking uh, organization, for instance, and uh, you're very colorful and bright and chatty and got lots of opinions and probably quite challenging, you find they're very interested and find it quite beguiling because they're surrounded by people who look like them and act like them every day. So think a little bit about how you play yourself so that you are bringing not just objectivity but difference. You know, you don't want to become your clients. Um, but be a partner to them. Ultimately, that's what they are looking for. It's tough enough. You saw that first chart about how much pressure they're under. Make sure that you're playing well to that and helping them as a partner. I love the story. I mean, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make here is about focusing conditions to allow for greatness. Um, there's, there's a story about Mick Jagger, and he once put out a brief, 70,000 pounds at the time, which when he looked like that was a shed load of cash. And, and he wanted an ambience manager. Have you heard this story? God, I'm showing I'm middle-aged, aren't I? <laughs> um, apparently, he just wanted someone to create the conditions for the team and the group to feel relaxed and creative and who knows what else he provided the ambience manager was in charge of. But I love the story because ultimately, that's actually what you've got to do within and without of the agency environment. When your clients walk in, do they feel like they're in an environment where greatness is going to happen? Have you got them so fired up about what they're going to see and what they're going to do? And you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a campaign or a big launch or just a simple tiny little OL piece of OLA. Create the conditions where there's an excitement in the room. Create the conditions, create the ambience, and you'll be amazed about the results. And I think similarly within the agency, I think we sometimes forget this, you know, you go and brief the creative team, here's a piece of paper, talk about and go, oh, the client shit, and blah, blah, blah. Never let yourself do that. Think about yourself as the ambience manager. Make sure that everyone who's engaged in the brief or the discussion or the challenge is thoroughly fascinated. There's a real art to creating ambience within agencies about your clients. Because even if it's the most dull client in the world, trust me, there's something magical to be found in that brief if you really focus your efforts. So, so do think about creating the conditions for greatness. Um, from a strategic point of view, actually, this is my point about being strategic, make sure that you don't become one of those people who, oh, yeah, we can do that, we can do that, and we do everything. Make sure you're not one of those. I think there's three questions I always ask myself when a client brings us a problem, because ultimately you don't want to just give them more of the same dross. You want to give them breakthroughs every conversation you have with them. You know, what, I always ask myself, what is it that our agency does best? What is it that we do best in our industry, probably best in the business? Um, what makes the agency money? And I think there isn't enough of that in the conversations these days. I, I love commercial account men. When you've clocked that you can, when you know how to make, make the agency money, honestly, you are indispensable. There's this whole sort of mythology about how you are, yeah, every agency, everyone's irreplaceable, you know, replaceable, everyone can be replaced by somebody else. I don't think you can. If you have got that client relationship and you know how to make money and do great work, you're, you're pretty much indispensable. But making money, you know, what makes your money, agency money? Doing this little piece of this might make me a couple of grand, but actually what will make the agency money commercially in the long term we're talking big scheme stuff. 
Um, make sure you understand that. And if you don't, go spend time with your finance director. I don't care whether your senior account director takes charge of that or the finance person does or there's some complex procurement process. Irrelevant. Make sure you know how your agency makes money. Um, and then what people genuinely care about. And I, I think that works on several levels. It is about, within the agency, what people care about and are passionate about. If you go to a team and you know that they're the wrong team and you're briefing them on something, have a think about that and go talk to your, your creative resources person or your, uh, your creative services person. You know, um, make sure you've got the right people thinking about your brief. And it doesn't always have to be the same people, but people who genuinely care about a particular technology or idea or person. And then also, when you're thinking about briefs that an agency wants to take on and make them money, make sure that you, they're briefs that the consumer will genuinely care about. So if you want to make breakthroughs, it's very simple. Keep that and sacrifice everything else. Don't do all that other faffing that, that sort of distracts you. So have a, have a think about that in terms of creating conditions for greatness, because that's where the breakthroughs happen, that's where the greatness happens, in that little intersection in all my experience. Taking responsibility. So this whole th narrative I talked about at the beginning about planners and media and all the rest and everyone else doing our jobs in production. <laughs> Actually, what I love about my job is everything is my responsibility. <laughs> Keeps me awake at night sometimes, but um, that's a great thing. I think one of the sad things about being a planner is you, you see a, a process up to a point and let go. It's, it's the sad thing about being um, a designer is you see it up to a certain point and then you have to let go. Even if, you, even if you're working through um, um, more organic processes. I, I love this uh, reference. You've all, everyone's got a David Putnam rock chart, right? <laughs> In account management presentations. Everyone knows about him, do, do they? One of the great suits, you know. And when he talks about running studios in Hollywood, I mean, his, uh, he's done some of the greatest movies of all time. Um, I think it's quite a nice and flattering way of thinking about the ultimate role of account management, uh, whether you're in tech or, or digital or advertising, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, this guy, Lord Putnam now, actually, was a suit. And now he heads up, uh, well, he's the first Brit to head up a major Hollywood film studio, uh, Columbia Pictures. And they did Chariots of Fire, Midnight Express, Memphis Bell, The Killing Fields, just to name some of them. Um, but all that experience he gained as a suit allowed him to become the owner of one of the most successful film studios in the world. And as our world moves into more into the space of entertainment and uh, et cetera, it's and where the combining of storytelling and technology will happen, those skills we're learning bring us to this kind of guy. You know, he was responsible for finding the money, finding the right backers, finding the right opportunity, finding the right story, finding the right creators, and developing the most incredible stuff. That's our job, and I love that. If anyone tells you, well, suits just get stuff done, I think you can flick that, actually, and say, yeah, they do. Look what he did. <laughs> so have a think about that just for your own courage. Sorry, I'm making noises again. Um, forget about titles. Um, I know it's a challenging and easy thing to say once you've got to a certain level of seniority, but please don't be preoccupied by hierarchy. Obviously, if you get your promotions and you get your titles, good. Um, if you think that's what the job is to get to the next title, um, just question it a little bit would be my uh, recommendation. I think think more about your personal development, and I, I've always used this to work out and map out where I am in my career versus titles. Because I, as far as I can understand, as far as I can discern, being a director in our business is pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> but understanding your genuine contribution towards business, this is used in Harvard Business, but it's also the Jim Collins Good to Great, um, and it talks about the different stages that you go through in your career and what it takes to get to leadership. And um, level one is the highly capable individual. And this is probably, for me, the grads, the guys that come in and they have talented, knowledgeable, they've got great skills, good work ethics. There's a fabulous um, thing, these grads that come in, and I'm, I wish I would, had been one of them. I probably would never have been good enough to be one of the grads. Um, but coming in as a highly capable individual and knowing that you have that and being confident about that. Level two is much more about being a contributing team member. So it is about group objectives, understanding the team dynamically, working effectively with others in a group setting. And I can't reiterate enough how important that's become as our business moved on. Um, but actually, when you come in and you're starting to learn your craft skills, understanding the group and contributing towards the group is one of the core skills that will get you to the next level, uh, which is about being a competent manager. And I suppose 
simplistically, this is probably account manager level, account director level, organizing people and resources towards effective and efficient pursuit of predetermined objectives. The language is very dry, but I quite like it for that because there's no glamour, there's no sort of jazz hands in, in this uh, way of labeling what we do. But I think that is just about knowing how to get stuff done to a certain extent. But there is an art in pulling together the right people and doing that, so I don't want to underestimate that role and how vital it is in organizations. You strip that out, the whole company falls over. So never underestimate any, at any level your contribution to the whole. I suppose effective leadership is where most of us stop. Um, and I suppose this is account director and above, which is catalyzing commitment to and vigorous pursuit of a clear and compelling vision, stimulating the group to high performance standards. And actually, one of the reasons I love being an account director was because I kind of took that to be my job. Um, and if you think about people that you really admire in our industry, that's kind of the level most of them get to. It's usually quite alpha, actually. People super confident out there pursuing things. You can all imagine that person. Um, and they have a powerful role to play in organizations. And if I think about most agencies, it's, it's a little bit short-termist uh, sometimes. It's kind of get, get stuff done and be a leader and be out front and have your name out there. I think there is another level which I love, and do go and read um, Jim Collins' stuff about effective leadership and level five leadership, because I, I personally love this idea of the executive being building enduring greatness through a par paradoxical combination of personal humility plus professional will. And there's a lovely essay on what that is, but when I think about the greatest people I've worked with in our industry and without our industry, actually, there's this astonishing sort of humility that comes through from these great leaders. Um, they, they tend to credit other people before themselves for the greatness of their organizations. They're incredibly long-term in their thinking. There's no sort of, oh, we've won a pitch, yay, we rock and roll. It's kind of, what's the trajectory we're on towards greatness and how do we sustain that? And there are very few agencies who've done that over time. And I think, and this is a bit harsh of me to say, but I think our leadership tends to get stuck at that effective leader rather than the executive level. And I think the other thing which is sometimes misunderstood and possibly bypassed is professional will. I think there's a huge amount of resilience required um, to do what we do day to day in business. I think within our industry and without our industry. So I love this definition and <coughs> it, the summary of it is the triumph of humility and fierce resolve. I mean, if you look at Sateri Leahy, if you look at some of the fabulous people in our industry, and I'm not going to call out names because it's quite a sort of personal list, um, those are the kind of leaders that you ultimately want to um, aim to be. So as you're building your career and building your profile and delivering success in your CV, make sure that you're thinking about your personal value set at the same time, because ultimately when you're leading other people, those things become more and more important. Um, I've simplified, I've, I've adopted this language, Gavin's here today, so he'll laugh because he'll know that I rant about this quite regularly. <laughs> but uh, does anyone just know what these two symbols are? It's just a little Greek alphabet test. Alpha and Omega. Um, and my experience of Adland was, I think there was a point in time where everything was alpha. Um, and that doesn't just mean male, by the way, I'm not sexist at all. Um, it, it is that animus, it's quite aggressive, it's thrusting, it's like go out and get stuff done and end of. And omega is much more circular in Greek language. I think alpha means ox, um, omega means much more circular. And I think the, the, the nature of the complexity of what we do, the complicated relationships we have to manage, the interagency relationships we ha have to manage, the complex stakeholder organizations we have to manage now, I think it's much more omega in terms of its behaviors and thinking. So, so my hypothesis, which I'm not sure is worth it, worthy of a trademark, <laughs> but it's my own personal enjoyment for the day, um, is that what we do has to be a combination attitudinally between alpha and omega. I think you have to be assertive, but you also have to be incredibly listening. It's very easy to be assertive without listening and very easy to be listening without assertive. You can't do one without the other. It is about setting an agenda and sharing an agenda. So, you know, going to a client and going, I'm going to sell them some client agenda, or some agency agenda, which I need to go and sell a website worth five million next week because that'll make me famous in the agency, is never going to get you anywhere. But going to the client, going, here's the issue, here's some ways we can unlock success together and get to that outcome I mentioned right at the beginning. You start to have a shared agenda, and I think that is actually, frankly, as important as setting an agenda. So um, think about that when you, even if you're dealing with a simple print ad, you know, just think about what that agenda is. I think it all used to be about the big presentations. 
I sort of miss that sometimes. <laughs> there was some magical sort of background and just actually in pitching, it's fantastic sometimes to just to do that, that sense of, you know, adrenaline in the room and you've have you done all the sort of paraphernalia and made the foyer of the agency look amazing, all that stuff. But actually, I think it's much more about engaging in conversation now. You know, because it's not campaign oriented all the time, it's almost an intuitive understanding of clients' business and it is ongoing. <coughs> And if you work in ad agencies, it's, you know, the tissue sessions have taken away and obviated this need for sort of too much jazz <coughs> hands. I think there are moments in time to bring out some of the magic, not let the client behind the curtain entirely. You don't want to open yourselves up and just be open to everyone and there's no mystique. Clients like a little bit of magic. But I think there's also just understanding that it's an ongoing conversation and not trying to <coughs> hide things from clients, not trying to put stuff into a black box. There's some mystique. Clients get very... Uh, annoyed and frustrated by that, so those sort of behaviours. And I think agency people do too. Um, it used to be about the big TV ad, the creative highlight. Not everything has to be creative. You know, I think ideas can be big and they can be small. And sometimes the small ideas are the magical ones. You know, that little piece of technology with the heart rate thing is as magical as the thought of your football, which is the sort of the idea that we came up for the next two, three years for the brand. One is not better than the other. Both have magic inherent in them, but I think understanding that creativity solves problems at all different levels now. Um, it all used to be about understanding your client's brand and lots of conversations with branding agencies. I think it's much more inherently about understanding your client's business now. So am I really gonna worry about pet insurance the next two weeks? No, let's just, put that through the system, get it in and out. Actually, the bigger challenge here is understanding <coughs> that the client has a pressure around pensions, you know, and just really helping prioritize because you understand your client's business. Um, it used to be all about getting into the exec suite. <coughs> I think the reality of the business we work in now is on occasion you do, and actually in your best relationships, you're in there at least once a month or twice a month. But stakeholder management, complex, big organizations, fantastic corporate slavery. Um, just knowing your way around and how to navigate those organizations is an art in and of itself. You have to, the analogy I always use is if you're climbing a wall, you have to have your crampons in across several parts in order to be able to get up the wall. And I think thinking about organizations and that, have you got your crampons in at different places? Which means, you know, understanding complex organizational structures, which is a much more amiga way of operating. You can't ignore the junior clients. You can't play politics with those guys. Bring them in, make them part of your team so that you can have your crampons in and be, behave with integrity in organizations. Um, it all used to be about results. You do a campaign, check the results, off you go. I think what I'm loving, and I think if any of you have read the articles about Mondelez, what they're trying to do um, in the States at the moment with the new model of handling their agencies, I don't know if anyone's read that literature, they're, trying, they're giving lots of agencies lots of things and not doing any pre-testing or any of that other stuff. It's all test and learn. And I think that's something that's very much familiar with people in tech and prototyping. Take the concepts to market and try it out real time. That's a much more exciting and creative way of getting work out there. So I think test and learn will become more and more the reality of what we work rather than pre-testing, Ipsos, perfectly crafted campaign and then results. So understanding that and making that part of your language I think is really key. And rather than alpha, which is all just go, 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 it's much more about bringing people with you. So it is much more about let's go. So my little toying with this thought of alpha and amiga is really important. I think, I don't know, people say this enough, um, and I might be slightly skewed because I am reading Ariana Huffington's Thrive at the moment. Um, the truth of our business is highly intense. It is 24-7. Those bloody mobile phones follow us everywhere. And if you find yourself checking your mobile phone late at night and working all the time, um, my piece of advice to you is the work will not stop. You need to stop the work so that you can look after yourself. It will make you more effective. And I personally struggle with this because I'm slightly a workaholic. <laughs> um, but do read these books because maybe you can uh, manage your career in a way that's less workaholic than mine, the way I've managed mine. But um, having time out, treating the work like a sprint. Go for a, If you've got something, you've got to get that campaign out. I've seen that team, they've thrown that themselves into it for weekends, late nights, early mornings to get it out. Have a breather, get your life back, go to gym, have a run, do what you need to do, meditate if you happen to be a meditator, I've never been able to manage that. Um, do what you need to do to get your, go to the Tate Modern, go and see what's, you know, open your mind, open your body, go and do stuff that's good for you because the business is incredibly intense. And I think having that time out makes you better I've got this rule where at least three nights a week I go and put my children to bed. That's 
then I can deal with anything, bring it on after that. But I need to have those two hours, three times a week, just time with my kids. That's my time to regenerate. Find out what your equivalent is and be really clear about it with your team. Between this time and this time, I'm a gym today. Sorry. <laughs> You'll be fine. No one, no one expects you to be a martyr. And honestly, no one's going to manage your time other than you. You know, you can easily become a martyr in this business. Um, and this is, a, this is one which sounds very obvious. Um, it was actually the advice my dad gave me when I came into the business. He was very successful. He worked with Diageo uh, for years, and he ran an agency. And, and I asked him when I was thinking of going into advertising, what is the thing that made you successful? And he said, I always had my integrity. I was my word. I kept my word. I never said anything because other people told me to. I just had my integrity. So I think there's a really sort of something that I've really held uh, close to me. I think my North Star and what keeps, um, allows me to sleep at night is genuinely thinking that the people that we're communicating with is ultimately my North Star. Am I doing something that's genuinely helpful in their lives? Is, am I doing something that will touch them, that will be <coughs> meaningful? Then I can forget about <laughs> all the other said, stuff said about our industry and sort of, I love it when the grads come in and say, you know, advertising isn't this terrible Machiavellian thing to try and get people to buy stuff. I think the reason I, 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 I think it does have to boil the wheels of, of capitalism, absolutely. Um, but the reason I can sleep at night and, and have conversations with my client, because I remember that, you know, these, there are ordinary people at the end of the day who may or may not think the carousel is the latest technology, but they will want a way of keeping their emotions and their memories in a, in a, in a place that, that is accessible. And I think that that clip does that beautifully, actually. It's probably my favorite Mad Men clip and also the bit where the TV producer has to leave because he's crying, it's just genius. Um, so <laughs> um, it, it's a little bit of an old school reference, but I think you get the point. And um, if, you go, if you're struggling with a conversation with a creative or a designer or with a client, or thinking about how you manage your career, just think about those people at the end of the day that our communications is touching and how they're touching it, because that will give you integrity. It's a really simple measure. Someone said, creative, some creative saying you've got to do this and someone saying you've got to do that. Forget about everyone else and go, what's the right ring for that person that I'm going to be talking to? And actually, it gives you integrity. It gives you a way of elevating yourself above the fray day to day. So <clears throat> what is the point again? <laughs> um, I've drawn up a list. And I, th I think uh, you know, it is about being strategic. It is be about being a partner, but an objective partner. Um, it is about focusing the conditions for greatness. Um, it is about being responsible for everything, and that is uh, a burden and a joy. Um, it is about being an authentic leader, and work out what that means for yourself, but do read that Jim Collins stuff. It's, it's quite pointy as well, actually. It shows me what not, what not being authentic leads to in terms of business results. Um, brings perspective and pace, so that's the point about looking after yourself. You know, unless you're looking after yourself, you can't bring perspective, you can't pace. Everything's always urgent all the time. Um, and have integrity. Um, ultimately, in this game, it's very easy to get swayed by all sorts of nonsense. And ultimately, we're very privileged to be in our industry. It's lots of fun. It's very creative. There's money to be made. But if you don't have integrity, it's a bit boring at the end of the day. So I think that would be the brief. <clears throat> and I think, you know, ultimately, that is the brief for CEOs. And there's no, there's no coincidence that 75% of the CEOs in London Somebody did that check for me. I hope that data point is correct, but it kind of <laughs> instinctively is correct. 75% of the CEOs in London are suits, with a few rare exceptions, you know. So take great courage from the day-to-day -day of what you're doing, and no matter how tough it is and how isolated you might feel and how overwhelmed you feel some days, because we all do, ultimately, everything you're learning in terms of that stuff means you're brilliant at running business in the end, if you learn your skills. So I think that's enough of me going on. Um, I hope that was a bit useful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me.